Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Sim Smarts, where we will talk about the latest and greatest in offline testing tools, as well as the use of various forms of machine learning to power some aspects, or in some cases, all aspects of an automated driving system. The purpose of this session is to kind of articulate the technical differences in how companies are tackling this self-driving software problem. Then we'll take questions from you, the audience. Uh, so with me today are Sarah Tariq, Director of Computer Vision at Zooks, which is trying to physically build and operate a robo-taxi fleet in Las Vegas and San Francisco, including to and from airports, very importantly. Uh, Charlotte Tao, Product Manager for Perception at Lyft's Autonomous Vehicle Development Unit, which is aiming to automate uh, some portion of Lyft's uh, existing human-driven trips, starting, I think, with suburban uh, street trips. Uh, Alex Kendall, coming to us from the UK, co-founder and CEO of Wave AI, uh, which is also trying to, to develop fully automated vehicles for urban settings. And uh, last but not least, Vlad Vorninsky, Varn CEO of Helm.ai, which is trying to develop, uh, first and foremost, a Tesla autopilot type of system for highway driving before developing a fully automated system for other settings. Um, I did not purposely try to pit men against women in this session, but it just so happens that the women here come from organizations that are trying to solve the self-driving car problem in a very, very different way from the organizations led by Alex and Vlad. Uh, Zooks and Lyft with a more traditional approach of mapping specific streets, using spinning LIDARs on tops of their vehicles, and using largely supervised, key, keyword supervised, deep learning for some aspects of the software stack, such as aiding in the detection of objects. Whereas Helm and Wave are trying to automate driving without LIDARs and uh, largely by throwing the, uh, reinforcement learning or in Helm's case, unsupervised deep learning algorithms at the problem, uh, sometimes known as end-to-end. -end. Um, and it's typically much cheaper than the traditional approach. Vlad, talk to us about unsupervised learning, which is what you know the, the tack you've taken from the start um, why you chose that and where has it gotten you today? And, and, and what do you think are the key differences between, um, between that, that type of approach and the approach that Sarah and Charlotte are articulating? Um, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. So the thing that we examined from the very beginning essentially was what would it take to actually make L4 truly scalable technology? Um, something that actually, you know, proliferates around the world. Um, and, you know, just due to some basic calculations, uh, you can see that the traditional AI methods um, are not really enough to get you there um, in a sense that, uh, you know, while deep neural networks effectively have, uh, you know, unlimited capacity uh, as you grow the size of the network, uh, they can learn arbitrary concepts. Um, the amount of data that you have to annotate using supervised approaches um, would not be something that is possible even for the most well-funded companies. You know, it might be required to annotate, you know, an order of trillions of images or more if you want to solve computer vision. And, uh, you know, the observation is that essentially the asymptotic bottleneck of L4 is effectively computer vision because of the long tail end and the insufficiency of uh, LiDAR and radar to actually provide enough information. Um, and so that's the kind of the heart of the problem as we see it for kind of the eventual uh, scaling up the technology. Um, and that's really the reason that we went after unsupervised learning is both because we saw it as a necessary component to scaling L4 uh, as a safety critical system, uh, but also because some, we had some very promising prototypes early on um, that we were able to develop that you know showed us that we can actually take this approach. Um, and so yeah, I mean essentially you know it really just comes down to the accuracy of your machine learning systems, right? And so you know the more accurate the systems are and the more breadth you can imbue into the AI system, um, the better your stack will be, not just from a safety and interpretability perspective, but also from the respect of the scalability and cost, right? Being able, being able to lean off of LiDAR over time or being able to build your maps a lot more cheaply, et cetera, is gonna really matter for, you know, kind of competing in the fleet space um, eventually, right? Um, but, you know, our view is that, you know, L4 is essentially still a non-deterministic timeline and so, that's the reason that we uh, license our technology in the L2 plus space, um, kind of us, you know, to incrementally uh, get to L4 eventually. Vlad, you're you're constantly kind of comparing your, pressing yourself to Tesla autopilot. Um, is that is that the, the the core metric for you, or are there some other uh, metrics that are more important to you right now as you're as you're out there, uh, either in simulation or out on the road? Um, yeah, so for developing L2 plus systems, you certainly have to do um, kind of 
constant benchmarking against other uh, other systems. Um, and so Tesla Autopilot is currently kind of a state-of-the-art production system for LT Plus. Um, but you know, it's not just about comparing disengagement rates. That's not really enough. Um, you really have to dig deeper and validate um, at the perception level, at the content prediction level, um, et cetera. I would say for LT Plus systems, it's uh, you know kind of less less tricky, just because it's uh, not supposed to be a fully autonomous system, and you can kind of get a sense for okay, there's a certain safety level we can shoot for, and the liability is actually shared with the driver, so it's not as big of an issue as for L4. Um, now for L4, I think it's uh, definitely a lot trickier. Uh, there, I would say the things that matter again, as I mentioned, is you know safety, interpretability, scalability, and cost. So from a safety perspective, you know. Uh, Getting to say statistical parity with a human driver could certainly be achievable in the near future, if not already now. But that's not going to be sufficient uh, in the sense that um, you know, let's say you get into an accident. Eventually, if you try to scale up your fleet, you're, some, something's going to happen. There's going to be an accident, and even if it wasn't your fault, uh, you'll have to prove that in a court of law. And how interpretable your system is, and how it's able to back up the optimality of its decision making, it's going to play a role. And that's that's an unknown right now. Nobody knows exactly how that's going to play out in the court system. So I think there's actually, in some ways, a first mover disadvantage uh, for, for for that for that particular aspect. Uh, and that interpretability variable uh, is going to be essentially you can think of it as kind of like the breadth of your machine learning capability, right? Like how many scenarios are you prepared for a priori? Um, and then for scalability, right? It's a question of uh, how quickly can you actually, uh, you know increase the coverage of your system and how much uh, infrastructure assumptions you have or you know what are you assuming right in order to be able to scale it up and cost is also an incredibly important metric um, you know to be able to compete I mean eventually there's going to be a lot of cost competition in space so th those are all kind of the things that uh, we would look at for all four and but nobody knows exactly kind of what the what the profile is even if you define the right metric for all of them to determine the product success. Well, from automated steering, I think Tesla is going to be a great uh, canary in the coal mine for either legal liability or press liability uh, as more and more vehicles get on the road. So I'm, I'm excited to see what, what happens there, although I'm not excited to, to hear about more collisions. So let, lightning round. Um, now, uh, I want to go back to simulation um, and understand really briefly what kind of simulation engines each of you are using um, and and how do you simulate things you haven't uh, seen before? Um, we might want to start with with Vlad. Um, obviously, you've got uh, neural networks that you're training on a variety of, of data sets. But what what can you say about your simulation engine uh, before we get to the others? Sure. Um, yeah. So we certainly use simulation um, for testing. You know, sort of planning and control uh, policies. Um, what and, type of software know, is it? Like, what's the? Is it like an Unreal Engine thing? Is it something else? What you know? What type of a simulator? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a combination of tools, some of which we've uh, built internally, others that are kind of open source, right, um, or proprietary. And um, yeah, but you know, one thing I'll say, sort of, I think that you know, the simulation that you can do for things like kind of planning control uh, is is relatively straightforward. I think simulation for, for example, actually training computer vision systems is definitely not sufficient. Um, and there, um, I think that there's no substitute for training on real data. Um, and that's kind of another uh, another reason that we, uh, that we work on supervised learning, right? So yeah, I mean, I kind of think of simulation, if you want to try to think of it as sort of really creating a realistic uh, simulation of, let's say, image data. I think to do that really, really well, or as you know, to create a, a realistic world is kind of as hard as solving the computer vision problem, generally speaking. Um, so I think there's definitely like a limit to today's simulation tools that's kind of inherent, and and that there needs to be uh, some kind of different approach if you want to make use of if you want to make use uh, of those tools to actually solve the problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because we, we've written um, probably not enough about simulation, uh, although I. I you know, we've written about Uber in the context of simulation, not only not prioritizing it um, before their, their crash in 2018, but since then just struggling with developing a, a simulator that helps them at a basic level understand uh, what the performance of their software will be when it's out on the road. 
um, even at a basic level, it seems. And Vlad, you probably agree with that, right? You've got one GPU that you're running on in the car, but you've got a lot more that you have to do offline. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I think it depends on if you're talking about L2 Plus versus L4, right? I mean, I think for L2 Plus, uh, we're definitely seeing a sufficient amount of compute um, that's coming out, and the compute platforms are going to be getting better and better and kind of cheaper over time. So that shouldn't be too much of a problem. But I do think that very soon we'll have deep neural networks that are, you know, very large that you can't run on the car, uh, you know, even if you put like 20 GPUs on there. So I don't know. I mean, I actually do think power efficiency is, is a pretty big problem for L4. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just, again, it, it, it kind of just depends on how you define product success in that space. If you need a system that's truly kind of human level uh, performance on computer vision or across the board on various all the scenarios you encounter, I think that would be a really, really large neural network. And I think that that wouldn't fit on today's compute. On a all right. Well, we are with you for the live Q&A. Welcome, everyone, for Wave and Helm is what are your thoughts on LiDAR, LiDAR data, since you don't use LiDAR, for unsupervised or reinforcement learning models? Great question. Um, so what I would say is um, it's not really a question of uh, LiDAR versus vision. Um, it really comes down to what's required to solve the tail end. And um, that can there are certain problems that really require computer vision. Um, and to clarify, uh, it's not that we don't use LiDAR, right? So we've actually done a, a LiDAR vision fusion for automation of uh, building HD maps. And uh, we do believe LiDAR can be a useful sensor for redundancy purposes. Um, but the issue with it is it more has to do with kind of the information periodic content of the sensor data in the sense that if I just gave you LiDAR outputs, um, even if it was very high resolution, that wouldn't actually be enough for you to be able to drive, uh, you know, safely, uh, safely on the roads. Um, uh, there was a part of that question that had to do with unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning with LiDAR. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, applying, I think that applying machine learning techniques to LiDAR data is generally speaking easier because there's just, uh, the data is kind of, uh, there's not as much information there in some sense. You're just getting kind of direct depth observations, but you can't really infer certain things and uh, you do have these direct measurements. So. Um, I, I don't really think that uh, the bottleneck uh, with using LiDAR data has to do with the machine learning component. It just has, has to do with information and content. So regarding simulation difficulty, just a quick comment here is that I think that uh, the hardest part to simulate actually has to do with the photometric appearance of various objects, um, if that's something people are doing in simulation, because essentially you can build uh, physics engines that are, that are pretty good. Um, but uh, the dimensionality of, you know, the set of all natural images is quite large. And so, um, you know, in my opinion, building a simulator that is, uh, you know, as good as the real world for, for, you know, modeling all the photometric data is pretty much as hard as solving computer vision in the first place. So I'd say that part is probably the hardest. And when it has to do with uh, things like contempt prediction, that's certainly also challenging, but it could, could be potentially solved using large scale machine learning. How important is context and how well does AI recognize context, rush hour, construction, football game that just got out, et cetera. I mean, deep neural networks uh, essentially have uh, unlimited capacity to learn concepts, right? So context is just the ability to integrate information from uh, different, let's say, parts of the image and you know, make some sort of global decisions. So uh, it comes down to the bottleneck is really to make sure that the neural networks use all the information appropriately it's not necessarily the capacity for them to learn that, to, to be able to represent that information. So, so uh, related question, Mehdi asks, uh, how do you isolate new or edge cases um, in, in the long tail, Vlad? Real quick. Yeah, so that can be done in various ways. Um, if there's access to any kind of fleet data, um, then obviously you can figure out when something went wrong and categorize uh, a given, uh, given tail end scenario. Um, there's information you can get from, uh, you know, accent statistics or uh, really uh, pretty broadly speaking, right, just getting a statistical sense of the tail end can be achieved in, in various ways. It doesn't have to be done with like your own fleet.